eager to say that we probably already believe what we will address, at least in this assembly. It's crafted more like a class, maybe a lecture. If it was to a different generic assembly, then I would reword myself on some points. But I know who we're talking to this morning. If believing a truth is level one, knowing it well enough to explain it is level two. And that's the level we need to get to in as many things as possible as we grow. I am thankful that the 13 lessons that we had in our Sunday school over the summertime are available online for, your, for you to view and to review until you're so comfortable. A good study, well structured and organized is fun to rewatch, believe it or not, until we get it down pat and can discuss it to other, to, with other people. We studied over the summertime what will happen, what the scriptures say will happen when the Lord returns. And we spent some time talking about the implications of what will not happen when the Lord returns. Premillennialism is a false doctrine. Cut down the whole tree, right? But there are some branches to that tree that were not specifically addressed or at least spotlighted. If you were in our summer quarter of summer of Sunday morning classes, consider this lesson a, a side note conclusion. But if you weren't in those classes, consider this an introduction to go to that series and watch and enjoy, yes, enjoy binge watching all those lessons, particularly the last three as we dealt with the kingdom that was established and the kingdom that the Lord is coming back for. With that being said, the war in Israel kicked up a lot of dust. Uh, and I'm referencing doctrinal dust this morning. And so it's going to be in... Uh, essential to wipe our lenses to see things again through the scriptural perspectives. And we are going to be equipped to explain this even afterwards. The selected passages on your handout today, and that will be referenced on the screen, at least cited on the screen, are to help us answer the specific question, is there a future for Israel? Is there a future for Israel? In an earthly sense, I'll be bold up front and say no. But in a spiritual sense, I will say absolutely. But as usual, people confuse the two. So let's let Scripture answer this specific question. And as we study, here are the questions to ask. Just who are His people? Because God does have a plan for His people. But what is it? And who are they? This is what we need to address. Who are the citizens of whatever kingdom is being discussed? God's covenant through Moses to the Hebrew people clearly shows that God chose the Hebrew nation, well, the Israelite kingdom, to be his chosen people to work through to bring about the Messiah. Prophecies of salvation, victory, and blessing are given to his chosen people throughout the covenants. So we might remember that you have the Hebrew people, when they became the nation of Israel, you have the United Kingdom, that kingdom divided, ten tribes went up north, was later overtaken by Assyria, gone. The two tribes the south, Judah and Benjamin, Judah and Benjamin continued a little while, but they were overtaken by Babylon, 606 to 586 B.C. And then, of course, after 70 years, they came back from Babylonian captivity. Technically, at that time, it's appropriate to refer to them as the Jews. Uh, all, let's see, all Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites were the Jews, chronologically speaking. So at that time, we're dealing with the Jews. Okay, that's the remnant that remains throughout the old remaining time of the Old Testament covenant. So here's the question. Is there still a future of reward for the Jews? What a question. I believe what the inspired writer Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. God is not the author of confusion. So frankly, upon reading the word with good contextual study, people either accept the word or reject the word. And those are the only two options. They tend to confuse the two, of course. But do they accept God's word or not? I don't want to make light of a serious situation, but this is to well illustrate how people can be. I want to show you two memes that showed up recently on one of my scrolling feeds of a Facebook media uh, media account, and this one I think was Facebook, the other are some others out there that I use. But here's an illustration, and I saw this shared by a Christian. Makes me wonder, makes me wonder. 
Israel doesn't occupy the land, they own the land. I'm thinking, okay, if you reference their presence as a sovereign nation, then I would say, I understand. But you'll never see me share this on my wall because a verse is cited. So what they are doing is giving credit to, they are employing the covenant that God made to Abraham, which shows that in the contextual flow of Scripture, the creator of that meme missed a whole lot. And we don't just flash stuff on the screen and, talk, and not talk about it. We spent the first six months of this year in our Wednesday night classes going through the flow of Old Testament revealed will leading into the new culminated in Christ. If I believe that the old pointed to the new and was completely uh, uh, summarized, concluded, and done away with at that point, totally fulfilled, that changes my perspective about all New Testament doctrine and the role of the church, doesn't it? And even the mission of our Lord coming to die on the cross. So I hope that the verses I plan to share are well received. Oh, I sure hope so, because the truth of God's word in any matter must be heard, and yet it's not always welcomed, is it? Uh, this is a meme I'm going to show you now. It's not about the matter at hand, but it well illustrates how things are. If you are a Marvel fan and you enjoy talking to your friends in love, sharing scripture verses for clarification to help better understanding, you'll relate to this meme. Uh, it's referencing baptism, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, and any verse clearly teaching on that matter. And thankfully the context only making it more clear. This is where the comparison of the flood waters come into play. And it says in relation to the the ark. How was the ark and those in it saved by the flood waters that cleanse the earth, right? And so baptism now saves you, quote unquote. The middle square left shows a guy saying, I don't like how you interpreted that. And the one on the middle square on the right says, I didn't just, I didn't interpret it. I just read it. And then, of course, what results is just an all-out brawl. And if you know the scene, you know the scene. Sadly, we can relate to that all too well because of how people either accept or most commonly reject the Word of God. But that just illustrates what we're talking about. Regarding future promise of Israel, we're just going to read verses, yes, of prophecy. And therefore, it's m even more important to make sure the context is understood in light of the prophecy. Keeping them in context of covenantal chronology. Then you can decide if there is any credence or support scripturally to this prominent teaching. And it's a teaching within premillennialism. And that whole tree, like I said, needs to be cut down. But the question is specifically, will Jesus, upon some physical return, which won't happen, just prior to a thousand year reign, which won't happen, gather Jews physically back to the area of Palestine for a special blessing and then to commission them to evangelize the world not uh, in some kingdom not yet established. But again, focus, Michael, focus. We addressed much of this in our classes, but today we're stressing this one point. Even though Scripture gives no support to any premillennialist doctrine, the speculations were refueled in 1948 when the United Nations formed the modern state of Israel and people ask all kinds of questions. Even then, they said, is this the beginning of the end? Is God finishing what he started? Is he bringing back the, his chosen people to that spot of land? And here we are 75 years later with the recent war and outbreak. And people understudied are asking the same questions. Sadly, Scripture is often referenced, but it's rarely consulted. Whenever passages are highlighted, they are isolated and then become a proof text out of context. It's only natural that most of the verses that are referenced come from what we call the Old Testament. If we believe the old was completely consummated, completed, and, and canceled by the new, then believing the New Testament is the authorized, now enforced covenant by Christ, the prophesied Messiah, makes all the difference in this matter. So to demonstrate how if taking a passage from the Old Testament sounds convincing, let's just read some of these passages that are commonly used and see what you think. Most of them are printed on your outline. Let's continue. Or let's get going. But if they will confess their sins and essentially humble themselves and repent, look at verse 42. 
I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember the land for the land will be deserted by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. And then verse 44. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely. Breaking my covenant with them. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant. So here's this idea. Here's this idea out there that, that the Jews may now be scattered all over the world because of some degree of punishment. But, but God will bring them back and, and restore them. That's an idea out there, and this is a passage that would be used. But a more common Old Testament passage is in Deuteronomy 30, verses 2 and following, because the wording is much more accommodative to this idea. Not suggestive, but accommodative. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all their heart, your heart, and with all your soul, according to everything I command you, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again for all the nations where he scattered you from all the nations. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers and you will take possessions of it. Okay. What's well, another passage that's commonly used, highlighted and isolated? Amos chapter 9, verse 15. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Jeremiah, one of my favorite prophets, chapter 30, verse 3. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. You want to go to verse 11 there? I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scattered you. <laughs> I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bring you back. And there's this idea. Just the reading then. Just the reading, of, uh, apart from all the contextual understanding that you may have, just the reading of this collection of verses. Sounds convincing. It seems like there's an idea that God's going to allow the Jews that are currently scattered to be brought back and take possession of a land. If there's any New Testament verse that proponents of this idea dare go to, and that the New Testament even references remotely, it would be Romans chapter 11 verse 26. And it says, <laughs> using Israel in a, in a sense, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Israel. Uh, again, take it out of context for the transition of who are they today. We're holding off momentarily for a reason explaining this. This is the closest New Testament passage that one might use to support this idea that God is prophesying future promise for Jewish people to take possession of a land, Israel, today, or yet to come. Oh, but honest Bible students simply cannot omit the whole New Testament. It's unveiled wheel, so we have to see how one leads to the other and what was referenced in the Old. And we also cannot, for that matter, omit Old Testament passages that might explain it too. The book of Leviticus, very significant books establishing the uh, worship code and the cultural code for their life and their whole, their whole existence in that matter. Chapter 26 of Leviticus teaches about the land being deserted and enjoying a type of Sabbath rest from Jewish occupancy. It's interesting, such prophecies are even in a book. What if I were to show you that that prophecy or that scripture was fulfilled and was fulfilled while the Jews were in Babylonian exile and were and was fulfilled only in that time 586 to, uh, to 536 BC 606 to 536 BC well let's go to Chronicles 2nd Chronicles 36 verse 21 the land enjoyed its Sabbath rests 
all the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. And by the way, Jeremiah is a thick book. And here, Scripture is making reference using the same terminology for the fulfillment of this idea. So the land did enjoy its Sabbath rests while desolate. And yes, it was fulfilled when they returned from Babylonian captivity. King Cyrus of the Persians said, you can go back. This passage references all of Jeremiah, again, a thick book. And Scripture tells us that the Lord's word through him was also fulfilled by these things done. Now, the passage in Deuteronomy about the Jews being scattered and then brought home has already happened a very long time ago. Let's go to Ezra, the priest reestablishing temple worship. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order to fulfill the word spoken by Jeremiah, not chapter 2 here. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 70 now. This is interesting. The priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, temple servants, along with all the others, and the rest of the Israelites settled in their towns. Here it is. They came back, and they inhabited the land that was promised to them. If you see a pro-premillennial meme or uh, a captioned image on screen that references Jeremiah, they will likely not include passages of Second Chronicles or even Ezra because that would de-emphasize what their focus is. They just don't want to. Proponents of this idea, they don't deny their history. They know it better than we do, all right? They know it well. They may simply say, though, that the prophecies are cyclic, that it was fulfilled in one sense now, but it has another meaning today. Now, in a way that's convenient... And in another way, that's very good to consider. That's a good question. Are those prophecies uh, a cyclic? Do they have double meaning and application still for today? Well, let's follow that up with a good question. Does the New Testament have anything to say about this? Thanks for holding in there with me, by the way. I told you this lesson was different. Hang in there. Does the New Testament have anything to say about this? It's almost a good question because you're arguing from uh, convenience or silence if you don't study the flow of doctrine and the unveiling of the New Covenant because the New Testament is silent on this matter, essentially. Could it be that it's silent because by that time it was their history entirely? That's a good question. The New Testament does emphasize the gospel and the point of the gospel so that anyone, anywhere, no matter what they've done, everywhere, everyone can come to be part of Christ's kingdom and be a child of Israel by faith. That is acknowledged regardless of the view that one seems to have or could have towards the role of the church. Indigenous from that, though essential to it, that is a view that some people could have. The New Testament does not mention anything about the Jews coming back to Palestine. Rather, the very premise seems to suggest that God's use of the Jewish nation or any one chosen nation for a particular purpose, and in particular to bring about the Messiah, is done. It's, it's, it's done. It's fulfilled. What was Jesus' mission? To complete the Mosaic Covenant, to be the sacrifice for all, to unite all under His truth, and to be... The one by which entrance into the kingdom of heaven can be established and made possible. And that is the kingdom that he will usher to the Father upon his return. That is New Testament doctrine. So, is there a future for Israel? No. Not in an earthly sense. But yes, in a spiritual sense. Let's see what the New Testament says. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. And I believe that the words I'm about to say are not de-emphasized by any other view. Well, they are by the views if you hold to them. But what I'm about to read is, I believe, inspired text with the meaning to the fullest. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Well, what? There is neither Jew nor Greek. No distinction made between the two anymore. Neither slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Verse 29. Are you with me in verse 29? This is so important. Highlight this. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. So because of my faith in Christ, I'm a descendant of Abraham by faith, legitimately to the full. Yes, and it even goes on to say a full heir of the promise of adoption, restoration, redemption, salvation of heaven itself, the new Zion that he gives to all who come to him in Christ. So the days of God working through any one chosen ethnic group of people to pit one above or especially over the other are over. It's documented in uh, Acts chapter 10 when Christ's kingdom was divinely extended to the Gentiles and it was made clear that that's always been the case and the intention that Peter said, I see that God shows no favoritism among men. No favoritism among men. And whether they know it or not, that's what people are doing. Everyone wants to feel like they're special and in a sense more special than other people. That's pride. When people think that one group over another is to be raised up as God's chosen people merely because of a bloodline or, or genetic feature... I think about the sentiment expressed again by the communion comments. The picture of Christ on the cross dying for all suggests that it's repulsive even to God to discount the entire meaning of His revealed will. So Romans chapter 10. I appreciate the reading of verses 1 through 4 by John a little earlier. Powerful passage. He says, in referencing to those who have not yet committed to Christ, listen to this, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That's the mission. For I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They don't know the truth yet. They don't see it. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. What was that? Who was that? It's only Christ who is righteous. They're not looking at Christ as the fulfillment of the law. We know that knowledge now. They, we are to submit to Christ. They see it. And it continues. Christ is the end of the law. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Christ's word is either accepted and believed joyfully or it's denied and rejected. But that's what it's teaching. What are we going to do with that knowledge? I referenced Romans chapter 11 verse 26 is scarcely used to reference this proponent or this aspect of doctrine because the verse right before it argues against it. Romans eleven twenty five says, Israel has experienced a hardening in their, in part, until the full number, number of Gentiles has come in. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. To not reference that passage is to acknowledge that it's still being done today. The truth is, some did come to Christ during that initial hardening when the gospel was being, being taught. That's good. But the full number has come to the... Uh, well, let's see, let me reword this. There, the invitation still is out there. So upon the completion of Christ's covenant and the doors being opened to all, now the full number can come in. You and I are part of that number. We're Gentiles. The doors are open for all to enter the kingdom Christ established upon his uh, death, established by the death, and then uh, established by the uh, ascension as well, enforced at that point. Whoever you are, whatever your heritage, whatever your ethnicity, no matter what you've done, you can become an adopted child of the righteous king. You can be forgiven by his grace. You can be restored because of his righteousness to his righteousness, you can joyfully and joyously serve him faithfully, living godly. You can serve him to his glory. You can even anticipate that heavenly dwelling upon his return. This is New Testament doctrine. But yes, God has promises for his people, and those were just referenced. Salvation, spiritual blessings. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Romans 4, 16 says... Therefore, the promise comes by faith. I hope you highlight that in your, in your uh, physical Bibles or even your digital copies. Just highlight that. The promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Who are his offspring? Those who are faithfully following Christ. Not only to those who are of the law... 
but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Oh, back to chapter 11, verse 26. And so all Israel, hear, O Israel, all Israel will be saved. Indeed it will. All Israel shall be saved. The one bound, not by bloodline or location, but by faith in Christ's redeeming blood. Oh, this is exciting. This is wonderful. Who are his children? By creation, we are all his children, but the Bible's question is, are we his by redemption through the blood of Christ? Christians are spiritual Israel. And I want to reference again the last three, the final three lessons of our Sunday school quarter last summer. Again, I don't want to make light of anything, but I do want to effectively illustrate it. This is another meme that you've seen it captioned many ways. The template's there from a famous movie, but it's the religious version uh, that I love, love to see. The top block says, did you know that Israel are God's people? The middle block factors in New Testament doctrine and says, God's people believe in Christ. The assumption is, as the New Testament presents it for all express purpose and will. The lower block, and you know, has no caption to imply, us, to imply a silent reply. The fullness of authority, the fullness of identity, the fullness of his teaching, the fullness of his purpose, Christ. Do you believe in Christ? The irony, and I mean the irony, of how Jerusalem was divinely punished by destruction in A.D. 70 for the same reason anyone will be eternally punished for not accepting the role that our Messiah came to fulfill. Christ came to forgive us of our sins. And if you do not believe that, there is no payment for your sins because He is who He says He is. I'm going to word these next three letters. Or no, let's see. Well, let me reword this. This next sentence has three words I will choose carefully. Those in Israel... The location, that is. Those in Israel today are welcome to join the kingdom, which is his church. But the key point is everyone is welcome to join the church, which is his kingdom, which he is returning for, which he will give to the Father upon his return. Acts chapter 2, Colossians chapter 1, and 1 Corinthians 15. I think I referenced for you... Um, Acts chapter 1, and then 2 Peter 3, just to, just to let you know that our focus should be on how his kingdom is not territorial, it's not national, it's international, it's spiritual, scripturally speaking. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 13, okay, I'm going to read this to conclude the lesson. Chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. In other words, oh, it's been a while since I said that. I forgot about it. No, no. He's just long-suffering. He's very patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's patient, allowing you to repent. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore... By the way, that one passage, verse 10, does away with the premillennialist doctrines. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what kind of persons are you to be? I'll tell you how. Holy in conduct, godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise... Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Sometimes when things don't go quite right on this planet and you see injustice, if you see unrighteousness and sin and inconsideration and all these things that are not right, you can just tell yourself there won't be any of that in heaven. 
And I'm looking forward to going to a place where there won't be any of the junk that takes place here. Have you been baptized into Christ? Why am I asking that? Because I want to know if you are an heir according to the promise. The promise that we have discussed today and the promise that, that is so often mistaught in the world around us. The promise that if you are in Christ, you can be forgiven. And the promise that God's going to be with you and all spiritual blessings are in Him, including the promise of salvation, ultimately from the wrath that is guaranteed to come to those who are not in Christ. Referencing Ron's class this morning, there's a, two big distinctions between accountable people, those who are in Christ and those who are not. And God knows who His people are. Are you in Christ? If you have not put Him on in baptism for the purposes that the gospel says, for the remission of your sins, it's a faith response yielding to His power by grace to wash away your sins. Let's make it happen as we stand and, and as we sing.